Hello and welcome to Let's Talk About It. I am your host, Taylor, and today I'm doing another in-person recording, which I'm very excited about. I am staying in the lovely city of Minneapolis and have really enjoyed my stay here. Um, recently stayed at the Aloft Hotel downtown and it was super like well located and everyone here is just so incredibly nice. Um, the Minnesota nice thing is definitely rang true. Um, was thought maybe it was just a stereotype, but everyone here has been totally, totally wonderful. And um, I'm really excited to be here today with my guest, Dr. Lauren Vogel, a licensed psychologist and an ASEC certified sex therapist. Um, her areas of expertise include low libido, sexual pelvic pain, problems achieving orgasm, erectile dysfunction, premature ejaculation. The list goes on and on. Any kind of sexual issue you can think of. Um, she's also kink and poly friendly, which we've talked on the podcast before about consensual non-monogamous relationships and um, poly relationships, open relationships, and we'll probably get a little bit into that today. Um, But she's also completing training in the Gottman Method and uses some of that uh, training in her practice as well. So I'm really excited to touch on some of these uh, topics and we're going to talk about relationships. We're going to talk about a relatively new theory, at least in in my experience. Um, And I'm really, really excited to be here in this office. So Welcome, Dr. Lauren. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, I'm excited. We're um, we're currently in your office now, and uh, it's it's you're you're kind of going through a little bit of transition. It sounds like right now, but I'm glad that we were able to make this work and and be in person. And um, it's 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 always really comforting to like actually record in person versus over audio. So I'm well, really you get all the behavioral cues and you get to Mm -hmm. look face to face and it's just, yeah, yeah, it's really nice. Yeah. In some ways we're almost looking in a mirror here because we both have curly hair and are both (laughs) wearing glasses. (laughs) Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yes. Um, But so I started following you on Instagram. um, Gosh, I want to say probably a few months ago. I've been following you for a few months now and keeping up with you on there. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. And I think it was last time I was here in August, I think I realized you were in Minneapolis. And then I was like, oh my gosh, I got to get together with her if I go back. (laughs) Got to come visit my office. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, Well, I'm glad you're here. Thanks. And before too. the snow. Yes. Yes. I honestly, I'm sorry. I probably wouldn't come back in, in winter time. Uh, yeah, I get it. I understand. <laughs> yeah. But you're also Canadian. I am. Yeah. Which I, I didn't know. grew up there and went to college there and spent yeah. like the first 22 years of my life there. Wow. So still will always think yeah. of myself as Canadian, mm-hmm. but I've been here in the U.S. for a while now. So yeah. it's, you know, I'm not Canadian to the Canadians, but I'm not American to the <laughs> Americans and so uh, yes woman without a home <laughs> <laughs> yes yes what um what part of of Canada were you in I grew up in Toronto okay yeah 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 somewhat familiar with that area yeah. that's a big city compared to Minneapolis the little city it is very big it's basically like another New York it is yeah it's, it's a little much for me I don't think I'd it's a lot it. yeah 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 I know. Yeah. I, I love visiting, but I, I, mm. I can't afford to live there. Yeah. It is also very expensive. It really. is. Yeah. Yeah. And and so you grew up there most of your life. Um, yep. And part of what I learned about you and that I really appreciated about you was that even though on your social media page, you are sharing a lot of great mental health resources and tips and, and things for people to learn on there, but that you are also sharing some bits of yourself, which I think yeah. is really important in terms of just like humanizing prof- professionals in like the helping field. Yeah. Um, but that where you've shared that, you know, generalized anxiety disorder was something you were diagnosed with when you were about 14. Yeah. Um, and And was wondering if you could share with us just kind of a little bit more about how that all came up. Yeah. I mean, what I'm learning and seeing from social media Mm -hmm. is that the way that many of us were trained in the history of um, therapy was to be this sort of blank slate. Totally. And not share anything about yourself and just Mm -hmm. make it all about your client or patient or however you refer to it. And um so there was really, you know, a pretty binary way to look at that. You mm-hmm. don't share anything. And if you do, it would seen as unethical and Super. harmful and mm-hmm. problematic. And 
which really just kind of further perpetuates stigma around totally. mental health. And it also keeps us in this role that is, um, it, there's like a power dynamic to that. Mm-hmm. Like I'm some sort of all knowing yes. expert and I'm there to heal and guide people. And that's just not where kind of modern therapists mm-hmm. are. Yeah. And in the world of social media and the ability to reach more people, we have an opportunity to also break down walls and help to destigmatize. And why should the fact that I have anxiety be something that I don't bring into the work that I do when I'm mm-hmm. treating anxiety pretty much on a daily basis? Yeah. So it just made sense to start being more open. And mm-hmm. You know, it's really important to have boundaries around that. And I have um, seen a lot of stuff going on um, social media about like what those boundaries should be. So if you have a therapist and they're spending all the time talking about themselves, (laughs) find (laughs) another therapist. But that it's okay for a therapist to bring some of their humanity into the room Mm -hmm. and to relate to you on that human level. Yeah. Um, And and I think that's like, it's, it's different a therapist sharing things on social media about themselves personally than in session with a client being like, hey, this is my Instagram page. Like, Go check out all these things I'm doing and my personal life experiences. Like, I think it's people, I think, tend to misconstrue that and and think of them as the same. Right. And, you know, I will bring myself into the room sometimes Mm -hmm. with my clients or patients in session, but not in a way to like make it about me and my story, Mm -hmm. but as a way to say like, I know what that's like. And, you know, a lot of that is normal or, Mm -hmm. you know, many people experience that. I've experienced that as a way to relate and to connect and to validate. Mm -hmm. Totally. That's a huge part of building the therapeutic relationship. And um, I think, again, helping reduce that stigma that you're not alone. And it can be really powerful to know that someone that does have this, you know, kind of more authoritative role is human and has struggled with this as well. Right. Yeah. And the times that, you know, I think being more authentic and human, Mm -hmm. it's backfired so few times compared to how many times it seemed to be really helpful and healing for Mm -hmm. people to just know that, you know, we're all in this together. Yeah, definitely. So, um, you know, historically I used to keep my own stuff very private Mm -hmm. and not share anything. Um, and I think since I've been on social media and exposed to different ideas about Mm -hmm. therapy, I've kind of opened up to the direction that we're going. Mm -hmm. And, um, again, with healthy boundaries. Um, I'm okay, you know, naming that I have this anxiety stuff going on and it's been going on a long time and Mm -hmm. I'm starting to befriend it and acknowledge it a little bit differently. And, um, you know, everything that I read, I'm trying to bring, you know, people along with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, it's time for a short break here. I want to share with you guys a new sponsor of the podcast who was actually uh, made in Seattle, which is my hometown and absolutely love. Um, And so I want to share with you guys Thrive Cosmetics, and that's cause... Uh, like a cause you care about. So Thrive Cosmetics is vegan and cruelty-free. And you guys know I'm plant-based and I like to be plant-based, not just in the food that I put in my body, but also with the the beauty products I use on my skin. Um, And so their beauty products, not only are they vegan and cruelty-free, but they are also very effective. So the mascara that I use uh, still gives my lashes like this amazing length, but they're effective in more than just way, one way. It's not just that their lash that their mascara still gives my lashes great length, but they're also effective um, because they give back. Um, so for every product that is purchased, Thrive Cosmetics donates to help a woman in need, whether it's um, they're emerging from homelessness or surviving domestic violence or fighting cancer. They're they're giving back in in communities all over, and so I want to really not just share this company with you guys as you know a great company that I love, but also for you to check out and actually start using. So you can start thriving and help women in need today by going to thrivecosmetics.com slash L-T-I-A. So the abbreviation for Let's Talk About It. Uh, For 15% off your first purchase, that's T-H-R-I-V-E, Thrive Cosmetics, C-A-U-S-E-M-E-T-I-C-S. 
com slash L-T-A-I for 15% off. Again, that's thrivecosmetics.com slash L-T-A-I. And we can get back to the show. So what did that look like for you as a, you know, as a tween, I guess, between, I guess, I don't know, would you consider 14? Yeah, I guess that's adolescent. I still kind of want to say tween, though. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Around that, you know, really vulnerable, important stage in your life um, that you were starting to experience some really intense anxiety. Yeah. I mean, I think we were naming it at that point. I was a really shy kid and I had very few friends and I was very introverted and often in my room kind of doing my own thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there were different ways to kind of look at that. But when I look back now, a lot of that was signs of anxiety and trying to regulate my nervous system Mm -hmm. by, you know, having quiet activities and being involved in like crafts and Mm -hmm. reading and just quiet time. Yeah. Um, and then as I got older, it started to shift. So I became a bit more outgoing and more social. Um, but it would come up sometimes in like physical ways. So I get a lot of like neck and back pain and tension and I have a lot of, um, like muscle aches and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think it's a journey that sort of shifts in how it expresses itself over time. Mm -hmm. And right now I'm like in a different phase with it and trying to, I I continue to experience it on an ongoing Mm -hmm. basis, but, um, I think trying some different things that I hadn't Mm -hmm. considered before. Hmm. Yeah. It's, and I think it is important to note too, that like anxiety is something that everyone feels on some level. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think it's just a matter of degree. Mm -hmm. And you know, what I'm learning is how much that's tied into our fight or flight response and Mm -hmm. how much it's a, it's a very, um, human thing that we do and it's about survival. Mm -hmm. It's just sometimes those wires are not really in tune with the actual level of threat that's going on around us. Mm -hmm. And so it's a really, you know, active system that's, you know, just very amped up to keep us going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and in that post where you kind of shared about experiencing anxiety and, and kind of this long journey with it, befriending it, Mm -hmm. as you say, Mm -hmm. um, you also mentioned that it was something you, that you used to feel a lot of shame around. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, well, A, you're definitely not alone in that. But B, yeah. um, what what that looked like, like where that shame was coming from, what that, you know, what that looked like for you. Right. I mean, I think a lot of my training mm-hmm. was what perpetuated shame for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, there was just a lack of disclosure by... Mm-hmm the uh, professors that I had, Mm -hmm. by the therapists that I had seen in the past. It was all very much like, you know, totally flat, you know, blank slate. And so I didn't have any modeling for that. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it, it felt like, I mean, I knew on an intellectual level that therapists are human. I am one. (laughs) And that we have mental health stuff. Yeah. But I also got the message that I should keep that to myself and Mm -hmm. not let anybody know that because the fear, I think, is that people will, um, you know, judge that or it will um, reduce my credibility. Mm -hmm. And I think it's sort of been over the past few years that I've journeyed toward thinking that that's actually a strength to the work that I do because I know firsthand what it's like to be human in this Mm -hmm. world. And so I can use both my professional training and my personal life experience to collaborate with patients and, and work with people. So, um, and I think social media was honestly a big part of that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, folks that I follow who share their own stories, um, paving the way for that. Yeah. Yeah. It's this weird, I mean, I I say this all the time and I got it from Brene Brown, um, where, by the way, I know she's fantastic. Someone has not read her yet. They Mm -hmm. need to remedy that right away. Yes. I feel like in almost every session of mine, I'm referencing her and I'm like, yeah, like, you know, her books might be a good resource for you. Or her Netflix special or Mm -hmm. her Ted Talks Talks, or just 
go to the YouTube yep. and find it all. <laughs> it's amazing. Yes. The, um, yeah. the empathy versus sympathy short. Yes. I did like a group therapy session on, um, when I was doing substance abuse rehabilitation in Baltimore. And that was like one of my favorite group sessions we had done. It yeah. was, it was really powerful, but she, she says, and this is just so, so, so true. And it comes up all the time, um, that, we think we're either people who need help or who give help. Right. And the reality is that we're both. Right. And I think that so much, I think that's such an important point to focus on, especially if you are in school to become some kind of helping professional that there is this like humanizing that needs to happen. And there's, I think a lot of the concern comes from like, are you going to be able to help other people like if you don't have your shit together? And it's yeah. like, well, guess what? No one has their shit together 100% of the time, like 100% together. Like that's so unrealistic. And right. yes, there is a degree of expertise and of knowledge and of practice that professionals are able to provide, but that doesn't mean that they are this blank slate and that they are this like uh, compassionate robot. Like we still are going to be human. Well, and I think, you know, that if we really were to break that down, yeah. do you really want to see somebody <laughs> who has it all together and is just this like mm-hmm. picture perfect life and doesn't yeah. know what it's like to, you know, lose your cool with your partner or have a meltdown or yeah. how is that something that they can really help you with if they've only read about it in books? Yeah. And, you know, the flip side of that is that I don't have to experience every single thing exactly. that my clients or patients uh, are experiencing to also be able to relate. Mm-hmm. So I think it's this balance between, yeah. you know, I have enough lived experience in the world mm-hmm. that I can draw on similar experiences and use yeah. that plus training and knowledge mm-hmm. to, you know, collaborate with, you know, whatever the goals are. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm so, I'm so glad that I asked you about that shame because I I didn't necessarily think or know that it would be related to training and kind of how that yeah. plays a role in it, but I do think that people in helping professions feel a different level of shame around their struggles with mental health because right. there does feel like there's this pressure that you have to have it together and you have to be a professional because otherwise people aren't going to think that you're credible to be able to help them. Well, I think it's um, authenticity plus boundaries. Yes. Yes. You can use a little bit of both. Mm-hmm. There needs to be boundaries around that. Yes. But it doesn't mean that we can't, you know, be ourselves in the experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Authenticity plus boundaries. Yeah. 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 That should be an Instagram post. I love that. Let's just I feel like that's that. gonna be Let's like a tomorrow piece of content. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> All right, so we're going to take a short break here. Um, I want to share, again, a sponsor that I absolutely have been loving and is kind of like all the buzz now talking about CBD. Um, but with Hemp Fusion, it is not just CBD. So they add in other things like omegas. And one of my favorites is um, they have like a liquid dietary supplement that you can do. So I actually have a vegan formula and it helps me focus with um, it kind of is targeted for mind and body balance. Um, and so mine, it's actually, it's like I said, it's liquid um, and it's citrus ginger with turmeric. And not only does it taste delicious, I can put it like in water if I want to, but I just take it plain. And it just kind of helps me like get a little bit more focused, feel a little bit more balanced, um, not as like stressed out and I've just really, really been loving it. And I also really appreciate that it's natural ingredients and it's vegan. So I I love that. I'm not big into taking pills. And so I love the fact that they offer it in different forms. So they also ship online and like any kind of natural product retailer near you and they ship anywhere in the US. So I want to help you guys out if you're interested and I think you should check it out. Uh, You can use promo code Taylor for $20 off your first order and free shipping at hempfusion.com. That's promo code Taylor. You can get Hemp Fusion shipped anywhere in the U.S. And don't forget to use the promo code Taylor for 20% off your first order and free shipping at hempfusion.com. It's quite delicious, honestly. And I could keep going on and on and on, but we can, uh, we can get back to the show now. 
One of the posts that you did that I wanted us to kind of get into a little bit today um, was around boundaries, actually. Yeah. So I'm glad we just talked about authenticity and boundaries. That was a great tie-in. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> look at these transitions. Go right there. Um, but yeah, you, you did a post talking about boundaries versus ultimatums. Yeah. And I think so often, even if I think about my own experience in life and in relationships, that oftentimes we really want to implement boundaries, uh, but that they aren't they're not really actually boundaries. <laughs> yeah. um, and I think there's a lot of confusion and uh, people oftentimes just end up miscommunicating on so many levels because they don't know how to actually communicate what, yeah. that, what their boundaries are. Wouldn't it be nice if we learned some of that in school? <laughs> right, it would be. All that algebra was so helpful. <laughs> yes, I'm glad I like know how to do my taxes, <laughs> right? And like do all these other things, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think this is a really common struggle for people. Mm-hmm. I mean, boundaries in general. Um, But this idea, I talk to folks often about like, have you considered saying this or Mm -hmm. implementing this? And it gets misconstrued as this ultimatum that, you know, and and that ultimatums are bad. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to distinguish between boundary and ultimatum. Yeah. So um, we'll start with ultimatum first ultimatum Mm -hmm. is about the other person and it's about trying to control or change what they are doing. Mm -hmm. So it's focused on them. If you don't do X, Y, Z, if you don't change, if you don't do this thing, Mm -hmm. bad things will happen. I will leave you. You'll be punished. Mm -hmm. Um, And so obviously that doesn't feel very good and (laughs) is... Not always the healthiest message. Now, I'm not talking about abusive situations. I'm talking about, yeah. you know, sort of other situations where there is some safety. Mm-hmm. Um, because if it's abusive, I think you get to say, like, I'm out of here. Yeah. <laughs> like, if you don't stop, I'm gone. Well, hopefully you, you know, are able to have that empowerment and that confidence to be able to yeah. peace out of there. But yeah. unfortunately, it's sometimes not it's not easy. the case. Yeah. 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 But, you know, for um, circumstances where there's something that's bothering you and you are um, trying to kind of say, here's what my limits are, because boundaries Mm -hmm. are really just, here's what's okay and here's what's not okay for me. Yeah. And then it's up to you to figure out how you're going to respond to that. Right. When that person does or doesn't do the thing that you're asking. Right. So the focus is more on you. Mm -hmm. And the focus is like, here's what I need to feel safe or for my own Mm well-being. And then, you know, if that is something that is not going to work for us or in this relationship or in this circumstance, then here's what that will look like for me. So it's really just letting other people know where that line is. Hmm. And then you know, following through with that and making it about yourself. So ultimatum, Mm -hmm. the focus is on the other person and trying to control and have power and punish. Mm -hmm. And boundaries are about here's what I'm okay with, here's what I'm not okay with, and here's what I'm going to need to do if this is the way it's going to be. So an example I often use is um, like alcoholism. Mm -hmm. And that's a really tough situation. I just want to acknowledge that. Yeah. And as much as that's tough and as much as we can have compassion, Mm -hmm. we also get to say, you know, if treatment isn't part of this and if, you know, this behavior continues, I have to protect myself and I have to, you know, seek safety somewhere else because that doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. Rather than you need to stop, you're out of control, you need to do all these different things. And I feel like even if, if you were to expand that and say, you know, if you don't stop... I'm going to like leave you. Uh Would you still consider that an ultimatum or would you then actually consider like if the person does actually literally leave the situation, then that was them enforcing a boundary? That is the boundary. I think it's just the way that it's communicated and the thought behind it. Mm -hmm. It's not about like I'm leaving you and that's a way to try to control your behavior. It's just letting you know, hey, you have agency over Mm -hmm. your behavior but I have agency over mine. And so if your plan is Mm -hmm. to keep doing what you're doing, I'm letting you know that that doesn't work for me. And then, you know, if that's going to be the way it is, then this is what I need to do for Mm me. Yeah. It's such a tricky thing to communicate around. I mean, I even think the example of when I was on Paradise and explained that 
you know, a, a real deal breaker for me in relationships is using abusive language Mm -hmm. that I've been in relationships in the past that, you know, were very verbally abusive Mm -hmm. and, you know, I swear a lot, but I'm not swearing like at my somebody. Yes. That's very different. It's so, 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 so different. And I was really appalled actually by people's reactions to me kind of enforcing that boundary or being even just like triggered and reacting to that when it happened. Hmm. Um, But yeah, like when I think about how I enforce that boundary, I was basically saying, well, I don't know, actually, I think it's a little bit different because sometimes you have already communicated what what your boundary is and then it's crossed and then... In that situation, like this partner already knows what that boundary was. It wasn't just like it happened and then you were like, well, I have to do this for me because, you know, this is not something I'm okay with. And they're just kind of learning the boundary on the spot. Right. Um, So, yeah. And for me in that situation, that boundary had already been communicated. And then it was like, oh, I don't like what you're saying. So fuck you. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, oh, mm, no, we talked about that. Mm -hmm. I'm actually going to need to take a break from this conversation now (laughs) because I no longer hear anything you're saying. Right. (laughs) Um, Well, and I think that's where people struggle too, because um, I get folks asking, well, you know, how many times do I have to state the boundary? How many times do I let that get crossed? Mm -hmm. You know, what does that look like? And um, so... I will often say to folks, you know, that's really individual. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the boundary is once. Yeah. And sometimes it's, I'm going to let you know gently first. And then I'm going to remind you of that a couple of times. And Mm -hmm. then if something doesn't change, you know, then I'm going to have to remove myself. Yeah. And again, it's about protecting ourselves and doing what's best for our well-being. So I need Mm -hmm. to go take a break and I am going to step away. Yeah. It's... It's interesting. I, 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 in a lot of ways, feel like very grateful that I even have all these tools and whatnot to be able to navigate in relationships. But at the same time, again, that humanizing part of being a professional is like these things are still really difficult to put into place. I'm working on boundaries probably for the rest of my life. Yeah. Because I just yeah. think that's how it works. Mm-hmm. And the hard thing also is that sometimes people get it. They're like, oh, that's a boundary. Cool. Okay, I got it. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, it's like, (laughs) I don't like this boundary. This doesn't doesn't feel Uh good to me or it's not what I want. And so we get this really negative reaction Mm -hmm. or we get like this guilting kind of behavior. And so um, I think, you know, just having a better understanding of what that is. And if we're delivering and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, upholding our message with respect. Mm -hmm. That's all I can do. All right. It's time for a quick break here. And I like to share this company here as just a little of a little piece of a reminder here. So trust and will is estate planning simplified. And I know it's not something that might be at the front of your brain, but it's something that can help you gain a peace of mind to protect your assets and your family. Um, It really only takes about 10 minutes to finish online starting at only $39. Um, Mine was, I took it and it was so easy to complete. Um, They offer guardianships, wills, and trusts in all 50 50 states. And they were honestly, it was like a lot of great information was provided throughout the process um, that I actually learned a lot. So I very much appreciated that. And honestly, I encourage you guys to kind of get this peace of mind. You never know what life is going to throw at you. And hopefully it doesn't throw anything at you. But just in case to get this kind of peace of mind, uh, I hope you guys check out Trust and Will. You can now get 10% off by going to trustandwill.com slash Taylor or entering promo code Taylor at trustandwill.com. Again, that's 10% off by going to trustandwill.com slash Taylor or entering promo code Taylor at trustandwill.com and get that peace of mind today. All right. We can get back to the show. I cannot even tell you. I have in one relationship that I had, like almost every boundary that I had was questioned. Mm -hmm. And like, (laughs) I'm going to get real personal here um, and feel very safe because uh, we are going to talk more about sex in this episode. So this is going to be a sex boundary. Um, (laughs) So for me, I have never 
allowed anyone to like come inside of me Mm -hmm. in my vagina Mm -hmm. with a condom without a condom whether I was on the pill or not on the pill Mm -hmm. it's not happening up in here Mm -hmm. and for me that's a hard boundary which for me it's like I don't even know actually if I'm thinking of like the full-out definition of boundary that like you know this is something that I need and then this is something I'm gonna have to do for myself um I've always communicated up front. I'm like, yeah, don't yeah. come inside me. Yeah. I, like you're going to pull out. I need to see it on me outside yeah. of my body. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I was in one relationship where there were so many conversations around this mm-hmm. and it was then labeled as an unhealthy come fear that mm-hmm. I had mm-hmm. because I did not want come inside of me. Right. And right. so that became about your problem. Yeah. Rather than I have a problem with that, yeah. that bothers me for whatever reason. Yeah. 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 Which is a little bit, and, and I think there's levels, so I'm going to use this term gently, but there's a <laughs> lot of stuff online right now about gaslighting. Oh, yes. Yes. And have, so in this particular I, relationship, there was a lot of that. <laughs> we need to acknowledge that there's levels for that mm-hmm. and not everything is, you know the same but um this idea that like i don't like your boundary so i'm gonna make it become like you have a problem and you have to go figure out your problem making you question your own beliefs and values i just don't like it and instead of making that the topic of conversation and the conversation being you know more about like either i don't understand where that comes from can we talk yeah. more about it how flexible mm-hmm. could this be yeah let's you know have a dialogue it's more mm-hmm. like you have a problem yeah and even because that with... absolves me of having to do anything to work on myself totally and and i think you know at least in this example for myself there were a lot of conversations around why that was and right. you know for right. me it's like yeah i'm saving that for like my husband i don't want to risk getting pregnant like it's just not so the answer was he doesn't like that yeah it was that he wanted to have that connection with me that for him coming inside of me not having to pull out mm-hmm. would have felt like he was more connected to me mm-hmm. and i was like well you know <laughs> There are a lot of ways we can feel connected to each other that don't put me and my body and my life at risk in mm-hmm. that way that mm-hmm. I'm not prepared to take a chance on. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And for me, really, like, respect mm-hmm. needed to be present. And mm-hmm. unfortunately, for a long time, it wasn't. Mm-hmm. Um, still didn't happen. Still held my boundary on that, mm-hmm. which in, I guess, a way he was respecting because he was did a not. hard boundary. Yeah, because he did not come inside of me Mm -hmm. and i suppose if he did would it yeah people can't see here but i'm doing scissor yeah motions in my fingers (laughs) and would it cut his dick off yeah yeah well not literally but (laughs) (laughs) figuratively in my head that that behavior is abusive and i think people need to know that it is again there's different levels and experiences not everything is the same but um that's really important if you set a boundary Especially with sex in general, but especially with sex, which is vulnerable and personal yeah. and, and it's just so important that whatever that is, you can not like it. You can mm-hmm. have, you know, dialogue about it, mm-hmm. but you cannot make decisions in the moment that are not stuff that was previously yes. agreed to. Mm-hmm. And that's where talking about sex is super important. Yeah. I find that I talk a lot about sex with someone before I actually have sex with them. Yeah. Like a lot. I'm very open to talk about sex and I I think many people aren't and I hope. Yeah. It's not common. And and the reason is because we don't see it modeled and we don't talk openly about it. So every Mm -hmm. time we talk openly about it, we are flying in the face of all that sexual shame. Yes. Yes. And I hope even going forward and even with this episode and some other episodes we've had that like people that want to talk about sex but don't necessarily feel comfortable talking about it, like share a podcast episode with that person and be like, oh, I just listened to this. Like, what are your thoughts on it? Right. (laughs) And like slowly ease into having that conversation. Well, and I think, you know, there's different parts to that, that you don't have to necessarily share all the details of what you're doing because you can choose how much privacy you want around that. Mm -hmm. Um, But the topic in and of itself... 
um, I see a lot, a lot of women who struggle with pain with intercourse. Mm. Okay, yeah. Um, that is much more common than we realize. Mm. The estimate, I think, is around 20% of women will experience painful sex at some point in their lives. Oh, wow. And we don't talk about it. A lot of uh, medical providers don't even know what to do with that. Mm-hmm. Um, where was I going with that? Oh my goodness. Now I just forgot what I was saying. Oh, about shame. <laughs> yeah. And so, <laughs> wow. Sorry guys. It's, it's the okay. end of the day. <laughs> um, yes. Shame. It so all goes shame. back to shame. <laughs> back to shame. Um, and so, you know, I think it's really different that, um, you know, that's a medical condition for a lot of yeah. women and, um, you know, they're going to doctor's appointments or whatever. And so many of them tell me the only person who knows what I'm going through is my partner mm. or like my mom or like one other person in the universe. And they're going to appointments and they're seeing medical providers. They're seeing me for sex therapy Mm -hmm. and they don't feel like they can talk about it with their friends. And, and I'm not saying like go to the, you know, corner of the Mm -hmm. street and, you know, put up a sandwich board, but (laughs) yeah, it's okay to say to the people who've earned the right to be part of that inner circle, Mm -hmm. like, Hey, you know, I'm going through some stuff and it's been hard. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't have to be like, don't say it at all or share every detail. Yeah. I, I'm going to TMI again on the sexual piece here. Um, it's just so easy to do when you're in a sex <laughs> therapy office. <laughs> it is. It is. Well, and like I'm used to doing it like a normal life. Like yeah. if we didn't have microphones right here, I would just go for it. Right. Um, but yeah, it's different when I'm putting it out there to the public entirely. Um All right, it's time for a short break here. I want to share a very, very valuable resource with you lovely, lovely listeners here. Um, I've shared BetterHelp before, and for anyone that's listening for the first time, uh, BetterHelp is a online resource for counseling. Uh, It's not a crisis line. They offer licensed professional counselors who are specialized in a variety of issues, whatever it is that you are struggling with. There will be a counselor available. They connect you with a professional counselor in a safe and private online environment, so anything that you share is confidential, just as it would be in a face-to-face session. It just really helps it be convenient if you feel like you're so on the go with life and feel like you can't fully commit to making the time in person. Or if you're looking for something that's maybe more affordable, BetterHelp, I think, is a great, great, great resource where you can schedule secure video or phone sessions and chat and text with your therapist. They also offer some financial assistance on there as well. You can do it on your phone, on your desktop. Um, They really make it just an overall easy, convenient experience, honestly. But right now, I, I want to help you guys out. I really, really, really encourage you to check out BetterHelp if you even are questioning if therapy is something you're interested in. Uh, it's truly an affordable option. And for Let's Talk About It listeners, you can get 10% off your first month with discount code Talk About It. So why not get started today? You should head on over to betterhelp.com slash talk about it. All you do is simply fill out a questionnaire. It's quite quick and it helps them assess your needs and then you get matched with a counselor that you'll probably love. (laughs) And if not, they make it really easy to switch. (laughs) So be sure to check them out at betterhelp.com slash talk about it for 10% off your first month. And we can get back to the show. Um, I'll say, and now I almost, I'm slightly losing it here. I know my example, but I'm forgetting how it was actually related to this. Um, okay. Talking to friends. Shame. Talking to Shame friends. and friends that like, so this was another boundary that this particular partner would push a little. Um, and also he had a fairly large penis. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have a small throat. And so actually deep throating and swallowing on top of that. Mm-hmm was not something I was down with Mm -hmm. and was like, sorry, (laughs) that's not going to happen. Yeah. And, um, partially I'm like, just like physiologically, I don't know how that's supposed to work. (laughs) And second, I was like, I'm not interested in trying to like force myself to do that. And that was, you know, that boundary, I suppose that I had was also, um, in a way disrespected and in a way like became a little embarrassing because it was like, Oh, like every girl I've been with has done this. And I was like, really? 
Really? First and of all, no. Yeah. And then so, second of all, really? Yeah, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I literally I'm going to try to talk you into doing something that is making you uncomfortable for my own pleasure. Yeah. That yeah. Because it was, a, it was a challenge for me because this particular partner enjoyed challenging me on things. Um, <laughs> so I basically, t- I started to feel that shame and I was like, no, like I can't be the only one. I was like, there's no way. There's no fucking way that every girl he's been with has swallowed like i don't buy this bullshit and i was like don't be small don't be small so i literally like took a poll with like the that next week like every girl i spoke to i was like hey so like do you swallow like even when it's like in the back in your throat you know like are you able to actually do that like is that you know do you enjoy that like do you do it all the time and most it was very like relieving to just put it out there in the first place and to just own it and be like i don't do this Mm -hmm. but like i'm just curious Mm -hmm. like if you're comfortable sharing with me like Mm -hmm. how do you handle this situation (laughs) and a lot of them were like that they don't necessarily swallow it when it's all the way back there but that they occasionally will swallow it, but it wasn't like an every time they do it kind of a thing, which gave me some relief. But I remember I was just like, I'm going to definitely talk to people about this because I don't want to sit in like this shame that's starting to come up. And then also again, like obviously boundaries in this relationship and all this stuff. And I think, you know, some of this is porn influence right totally I, because I think i said that where at one point. did we get this idea yeah. that you have to you know put yourself in pain and yeah. and be uncomfortable and do certain things mm-hmm. and are we doing those things because that is what i want to do yeah. is it focused on pleasure is it something that i am yeah. you know having agency over yeah. or is it something that i think that i am supposed to do or have to do mm-hmm. or trying to prove something yeah I was because like, I'm not those a porn star. are not, yeah. Those I'm not getting paid not, to suck your penis. Yeah. Those are not good reasons to do it. No. To try to prove something or to feel like yeah. if I don't do this thing, I won't be liked or yeah. I, you know, I won't be, um, you know, able to have this relationship. Yeah. Or if that's the thing that's going to end the relationship, mm-hmm. bye now. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Bye bye. Because you know what? Go find yourself that person. Yeah. There's somebody out there. That's just not me. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Yes. Yes. I agree. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Porn is not education. Yeah. Yeah. It unfortunately has been. It's been. But we need more information than that. Yeah. Yeah. That's just stuff to look good. But it's not what people are actually doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've actually... um, a resource I believe I've shared on the podcast before, but um, Erica Lust is a adult filmmaker and she has, um, her website is X Confessions. And mm. I very much have appreciated like the films that she makes. There's things that I'm like, oh, like that feels nice to see that. Like hairy armpits. I'm like, oh yeah, mm. thanks. Like sometimes, yeah, I don't Real shave world my Yeah, sex. it's very, yes, exactly. I haven't checked it out yet because... Every time I think to do it, I'm at work and they block me from all the websites (laughs) that actually relate to my job. You're like, Um, no, 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 guys. This is just research. Can you let me on this website? I'm working. (laughs) But there's a website that I have read a lot about and heard a lot about, um, which is called Make Love Not Porn. Okay. I haven't heard of that. And so folks can check that out if they are interested in learning about what real life sex looks like. Yeah. And they are real real folks, real couples, real people. And I think they upload their own stuff and it's feminist, uh, Hmm. feminist run and people get paid and it's ethical. Mm -hmm. And so that's amazing. I feel like check out, I feel like that was almost what Tumblr was for people for a while before it died. Yeah. Yeah. I only discovered it two months before all that happened. I know it's really sad. Yeah. Um, one thing I want to make sure we 
chat a little bit about here because it's not something I'm familiar with at all. And I've seen you post about it. Um, and you mentioned that it's something you're still kind of learning more about, but yep. would love, love, love to hear a little bit about this um, polyvagal. Vagal, polyvagal theory yeah. um, and kind of how our nervous system affects our sexuality. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, polyvagal theory is um, something that was developed just in the 90s. So in the scheme of like science and psychology, that's relatively new. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was developed by uh, Dr. Stephen Porges. Mm -hmm. And um, basically it's studying our nervous system. And I am just, I'm a learner like everyone else. So Mm -hmm. I'm just starting to kind of dive into this and and read the books about it. Um, It's only really become part of the therapy world and the mental health world, maybe in the past 10 years, maybe Mm -hmm. a little bit longer. Yeah, very Um, new. I know among a lot of my peers and from social media, it's starting to make the rounds Mm -hmm. and everyone's kind of diving in. Um, What I've known for a long time though, and what we do know is that you have to be in a certain state with your nervous system Hmm. in order to have certain sexual experiences. Totally. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So... Um, nervous system is basically, do you feel safe and calm? Do you feel at rest? Mm-hmm. And that's when we're at our best. Yeah. Or do you feel some sort of threat or danger? Yeah. Like that lack of safety. Like, like your, your boundaries, boundaries aren't might respected. get crossed <laughs> or, you yeah. know, and it can be other things too, like um, feeling really self-conscious, mm-hmm. um, spectatoring, which is when we're kind of like watching ourselves doing the thing instead of just yeah. experiencing the thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it, that's a big thing that happens that gets people really, big. really in their head yeah. about what's happening and then they're yep. not able to actually like experience that pleasure. Right. Because you lose touch with your body. Yeah. And for a lot of folks, sex is a very embodied thing that they're doing. Mm-hmm. So if you're not present for it, how are you supposed to have all the things happen? Yep. So um, it's interesting. So the... Um, The ability to, I kind of put desire in here and there's not a lot of writing and research about how this stuff affects sexual Mm -hmm. health. Like Mm -hmm. I'm looking for it and, you know, please feel free to shout me on Instagram if you find some of the stuff because I think it's really interesting Mm -hmm. and there's not a lot that I can find. Um, For desire and for arousal, you have to feel safe first and you have to be in a calm space. Yeah. And so... um, you know, if our nervous system senses threat and not just, you know, like physical threat or, mm-hmm. you know, some sort of like actual danger, but perceived threat, like getting into our heads or, you know, making a list of things that we forgot to do or whatever it is, it's going to be really hard to get aroused. And I see this a lot with, um, the men that I work with, hmm. this is where a lot of people struggle with like performance anxiety because they're getting so much into their head that it's clicking on their nervous system stress response. They're getting into fight or flight. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, fight or flight is designed to keep us alive and safe. Having a good boner, (laughs) not going to keep you alive if you're actually in danger. Yes. (laughs) That boner is not going to help keep you alive. (laughs) Not a good thing to have. (laughs) Problem is... Most of us, hopefully, Mm -hmm. are not in actual danger most of the time. And so the nervous system is perceiving danger where there is an actual danger and it's doing the opposite of what you want it to do. Yeah. So I do a lot of work with folks on, you know, regulating their nervous system through Mm -hmm. taking deep breaths from the belly, Mm -hmm. taking the pressure off of the experience. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting is we have to be in this calm and rested state to have the interest and to get aroused. Mm -hmm. Orgasm happens actually when we click back into fight or flight. So with arousal, we have like slower breath and we're kind of like building up. Yeah, Orgasm is like the culmination of that. Hmm. And our breathing starts to get more rapid and our heart Mm -hmm. rate starts to go up and we're mobilizing. There's more movement in our body. And then it ends with 
that orgasm. Mm -hmm. And so some people kind of struggle with that because if they're trying to be like too relaxed, then they're not getting over that threshold and their body is just like too chilled out to (laughs) kind of get there. Yeah. (laughs) So we got to start off in a little bit of the chill and then kind of work into it. And Mm -hmm. so um, my thinking lately, and this is sort of newly developing, mm-hmm. um, and I certainly don't lay like, claim to this. I don't know that this is really my stuff, yeah. but my thought is that, you know, we have to, you know, kind of maximize some of what we can do with our breath hmm. to help us get to the state that we want to be. Yeah. So if you want to get aroused and get into it, like take some deep belly breaths and relax your system. Hmm. And as you're getting closer to the point where you want to kind of build that arousal and excitement and have an orgasm, you can even play around with your breath and do some like heavier breathing and sort of like a panting. Just be careful not to like pass out. (laughs) No hyperventilating. (laughs) But like, you know, using your breath, using your body to like move into the buildup. And that might be one way that helps folks who are struggling with that. Yeah. Huh. That I mean, like, it makes sense. Right? Yeah. Like, it's one of those things that you've never heard kind of verbalized or, like, actually put out there. But then you're just like, yeah, that is what that is. And that is what's happening. And that makes sense that this would cause this. And Right. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So, you know, one of the top complaints I hear from women is that they have low desire for sex. Yeah. There's, that is a book that I'm writing literally yes. right now, um, co-authoring, I should say. You um, are writing. Don't, <laughs> don't downplay yourself. <laughs> but um, and that's a whole episode in and of itself. Yeah. But, you know, one idea could be that if you're, you know, kind of stuck in that fight or flight response mm-hmm. and it's go, go, go and just trying to, you know, check all the boxes that's maybe a big reason why folks struggle with desire. Yeah. It's because you're just not in a framework to be even thinking about. It's not on your radar. Yeah. That makes sense. Lots of meditation and yoga Mm -hmm. and kind of breathing into the moment might help some people sort of calm Mm -hmm. their nervous system. Yeah. I think breathing, I mean, even I had a video session today with one of my clients and we did a few breathing exercises. Um, just there was a lot of anxiety present. Yeah. And it it always fascinates me the impact that just focusing on your breathing has. And I think, you know, when I think back to myself, like maybe even in high school, you know, maybe even in college still, the idea of someone being like, just breathe oh, was like, so shut up. Woo woo. Yeah. Like, like, it was just like, I don't want to close my eyes and fo- like, get out of here. Like, I'm fine. Like, I would just... I'm fine. (laughs) Because I think that what I really try to do is first of all, acknowledge that like that sounds really minimizing and Mm -hmm. basic. Mm -hmm. And here's why we recommend breathing. Here's why we recommend yoga and meditation. Mm -hmm. Because so many of us are told do these things, but we're not told why. And we don't get the information Mm -hmm. as to like, you know, what's happening in our body. Mm -hmm. So when you explain stuff like polyvagal theory, that you have this vagus nerve, which is your 10th cranial nerve, kind of back of the neck, Mm -hmm. that monitors everything in your torso from your breathing to your heart rate to your blood pressure and your digestion and the only direct path you have to control any of that is through extending an exhale (laughs) so that when you explain it like that and you're like Mm -hmm. stop taking in all these like really shallow inhales yeah slow down your exhale Mm -hmm. And breathe from your belly. And if you don't know how to do that, like YouTube is a great resource. Look up some, you know, yoga breathing, breath work, pranayama breathing, Mm -hmm. um, and learn that. And it is our only direct line to our nervous system that we have that kind of control over that can have a more immediate impact. Yeah. So when you explain it and people are like, oh, that kind of makes sense. I get it. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, okay, maybe I'll actually do this Yeah. versus, oh, you should just breathe. It's good for you. Mm -hmm. And you're like, thanks. I think I have that covered. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yes. Yes, exactly. Most of us are breathing from our chest Mm -hmm. and most of us are breathing. Most of us (laughs) are breathing um, a really shallow breath. Mm -hmm 
from the chest. Yeah. And so when we just take time to kind of regroup and pay attention and breathe from the belly mm-hmm. and breathe out through the mouth and slow that down, you feel a shift. Yeah. And it's, it, you're never really just kind of unconsciously taking a deep breath. No. Like, well, order, you have to train yourself to do that. Yeah. Like I feel like you have to literally intentionally yes. take a deep belly breath. Yes. Otherwise that's not a breath that's just naturally occurring for you. Well, right. So our set point is shallow breathing yeah. and is more of that like sympathetic fight or flight breathing mm-hmm. for most of us, mainly because we are living really frantic lives. And yeah. so our breathing matches our lifestyle. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sure that you know, the monks and people who live maybe seaside or something, yeah. you know, maybe have a different breathing pattern. I know mm-hmm. for me, I hold my breath a lot. Yeah. And it's only when you become aware that you can start to make that shift. Yeah. And then it's a conscious practice on a regular basis to try to kind of move the set point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it really makes a difference. It's just the hard part like everything, mm-hmm. is it takes consistent, ongoing rewiring yeah. of our system. Yeah. So when you deep breathe like three times and you're like, this doesn't work, I don't like it. Well, yeah, because <laughs> for the last 30 something years or however old, you know, yeah. you've been breathing this other way and that's yeah. the dominant way. Mm-hmm. And it and it makes a lot of sense even like, I'm just thinking as you explain being able to reach orgasm, how that breath starts to change. Just speed it even. up a little bit. Yeah. I'm, I don't know. Just so many things are going through my head now. Now you're about... going to be like spectatoring. Yeah. <laughs> Watching yourself. Yeah. I feel like I will be now. Um, I just, just being... ruined it for so many people. <laughs> yeah. Now we're just going to be like, I'm too self-aware I'm to have sex. I'm monitoring my breathing. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's, I mean, I'm, I'm curious kind of how the work has been for you with women who are struggling to achieve orgasm and just kind of the emphasis overall on orgasm and coming for women Mm -hmm. um, that even just that in and of itself sometimes Mm -hmm. is stressful, Mm -hmm. which I think kicks in Mm -hmm. that nervous system and makes it so that you're not actually relaxed to be able to be aroused because now there's this pressure of like, oh, he wants to make me come. A lot of balancing here. Yeah. it's, Yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. Problems with orgasm are first of all, very common, more so in people who have a vulva or clitoris than people who have a penis. Um, One's more external, one's more internal. So not the vulva, but the clitoris. Um, And I think, you know, there's a lot of layers to that. Um, Sex toys are really common and and great and popular because Mm -hmm. they help to get there for mm-hmm. a lot of folks. Yeah. Um, most uh, cisgender women um, don't have orgasms from penetration alone. Yeah. And if they do, it's usually because there's some sort of clitoral stimulation happening as well. Mm-hmm. So um, sometimes it's just a quick, like, you know, education. Yeah. Here's where your clitoris is. Here's how to, you know, do some things to stimulate it and, you know, have fun. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's, we're getting too much in our head and we're stressing ourselves out and we're not present Mm -hmm. or we're disassociated and we're somewhere else. And we're not even like really in our body, like Mm -hmm. even more so than just being distracted. Um, Sometimes it's that our partners are registering is not so safe for us. Yeah. Not maybe from a physical level, but from a nervous system level. Yeah. Like, I don't know if you're going to follow my boundaries. I don't know where this is going. I don't know if I make a weird face when I orgasm. Are you going (laughs) to judge me for that? You know, all of that stuff can impact whether you, you know, can climax. Yeah. There's so so many thoughts to sort through that come up so naturally and come up so just like spitfire in your head. Um, And again, I think that is where that breathing and again, also making sure that you are with a partner that is safe and you feel loving with to be able to actually let some of those walls down to be able to focus and and enjoy that pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious how 
the role of masturbation plays for you and some of the work that you do. And I, even as I say that, I'm like, how does masturbation play how does role in the work you do? masturbation affect my life? <laughs> but I guess in um, either in personal life, what your like experience, what your journey has been with that, but then also like what role that plays with the clients that you work with mm-hmm. um, and specifically how that can maybe help with orgasm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think number one, if you are someone who has struggled with orgasm, the best playing field to start with is on your own. Yeah. Um, you need to know what works for you. You need to feel comfortable. And the best way to do that is by yourself when you're not trying to figure out where am I at? Where's this other person at? What, Mm -hmm. you know, what are we doing? It's just, um, a less pressured environment Mm -hmm. and you're only focused on your own body and just trying to figure out what works for you. And whether that's with a toy, whether that's just with your own hand on Mm -hmm. your own, with erotica, without erotica, and just kind of, you know, investigating what works and Mm -hmm. um, what you like so that then you can bring that in. And here's where a lot of people get stuck. They do one thing on their Mm -hmm. own and that works, Mm -hmm. hopefully, and, you know... Read Becoming Clitorate by Lori Mintz if if you're struggling. I've never heard um, that. I'm going to so read good. that. Becoming Clitorate is the best <laughs> title ever. Yes, it is. Um, and um, what we expect is that it's going to work this way over here. But then when I'm with a partner, it's supposed to work this other way. Mm. And yeah. that's part of the problem is a lot of women will masturbate with clitoral stimulation and use a toy or use their hand, use a lot of pressure, or, you know, some some way that works for them and then go with a partner. This is usually a heterosexual woman problem. Yeah. A partner who has a penis and have, you know, penetrative vaginal sacs or anal sacs or however it is and expect that to do the same thing that was happening when they were on their own and it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And then... This horrible thing happens where we look to ourselves and say, well, something must be wrong with me. Like I'm broken. Or, and you are not broken. Mm-hmm. You are just expecting something to happen that's not likely to happen. And we estimate that 70 to 90% of women, oh. it's not happening with penetration alone. Yeah. It's, I don't know if you've uh, seen this. Nikki Glazer just had a stand up on Netflix, Bangin. No. And she did this, there was this bit that just, Spoke to me so, so, so much. Um, I only, like, in the last year and a half, two years maybe, have actually started experimenting and exploring my own masturbation. Mm -hmm. Like, apart from just, I don't know. I I consider it, like, full-out masturbation. Good efforts. Yeah, like (laughs) an actual intentional, like, I'm going to masturbate as opposed to just, like... Oh, I woke up like squeezing my legs together or something. Right, right. Um, so <laughs> it's only been in the last, you know, few years, whatever, that I've actually like, intentionally a- attempted at times to masturbate. Yeah. And Nikki did this part where she was like, you know, as a woman, it's really hard to fuck yourself. <laughs> like, <laughs> clit stuff, so easy. Like, you do clit stuff all day. But, like, to actually fuck yourself, like, if you want that penetration, it's so hard to do. You got to, like, get these angles. And yeah. she makes this joke about, like, if you've done CrossFit, you know, it's really hard. <laughs> and for me, I'm like, I have two metal rods in my back that, like, make my, like, posture super straight. Like, I can't reach angles. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to reach. And then you're just, like, frustrated with yourself. And then you're just, like... <sighs> Forget it. Yeah. 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 But, but the, the, <laughs> I love that bit so much. She was like, and for guys, they just got to like, just jerk it. And it's mm-hmm. like, that motion is just mm-hmm. so easy. Mm-hmm. Um, that I thought mm-hmm. it was so funny, but it does the, um, I've, I've shared a little bit of some of the toys that I've used. And one of them is like a clit vacuum sucker. Oh thing. yeah. Like satisfier or womanizer. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, I had, always kind of heard of them, but was always like, what is actually going to do? Like, why would I want something to like suck my clit? Like that'd be kind of weird. Mm. And then I hooked up with this one guy and 
I don't even know what he did, but it was the best oral sex I've mm-hmm. ever received. Mm-hmm. Like came from it. And I was like, what's happening? Mm-hmm. And the only way I could describe it was like, I don't know. He was like sucking on my clit. Mm-hmm. And then afterwards <laughs> I was like, I think these toys are actually. To that. <laughs> yeah. And now I use the toys and they're fantastic, but it is a very different experience using the toys with yourself and then being with a partner and expecting that penetration to do the same thing or even incorporating the penetration with some of the toys or right. the clit. Like, right. It is definitely a different experience. Well, and, and that's where you have to explore kind of what works best for you. Mm-hmm. Some people um, will self-stimulate like face down. Some people are face yeah. up. Some people have a lot of like tension and rigidity in their legs and mm-hmm. in their body to build tension. Yeah. Some people need to be more relaxed than that. And then there's pressure and mm-hmm. intensity. And so there's all these yeah. variables. Some people like sucking. Some people mm-hmm. like more of like an intense vibration. Yeah. So, you know, if you're an intense vibration person or if you're somebody who needs a lot of pressure, Mm -hmm. one of those toys that you just described wouldn't maybe work for you. But Mm -hmm. for somebody who really likes that other sensation, it's great. So, you know, you might need to try a few things and Mm -hmm. see what works for you. And it is an intentional exploration. It It is, is. it's, you know, getting a few aids and, you know, Mm -hmm. trying some different things and making time to explore your own body. Once you know what works for you, then translate that to partnered sex. Yes. And if you have partners that are saying you shouldn't need that or it should be this other way or whatever, know that that is their ego stuff, mm-hmm. their lack of information that is not about you. Mm-hmm. And you can direct them to do a little bit of research <laughs> because it is not yes. okay yes. for male partners to tell female partners like, this is the way it should be and something's Mm -hmm. wrong with you because that is just some masculine crap right there. As rude. Yeah, that is just not okay. (laughs) Yeah. And I I think, I think it's, like it makes sense to me now, but I think before even hearing, you know, if you're having trouble with orgasm in partnered sex to try masturbation first. Yeah. For me, it was always just like, I would rather just have that connection with that person. And that's right. what makes me feel like connected and good. And that's how I'm going to reach orgasm. Right. Um, but it really is like getting in touch with yourself. And I think it it has really impacted the way that I've then shown up in partnered sex, yeah. exploring my own masturbation. And it is totally an intentional exploration. Well, and usually, I mean, if you unpack that a bit, that stuff about exploring our own bodies and touching ourselves mm-hmm. and especially as women, yeah. there's shame attached to that. There's mm-hmm. stigma about that. There's yeah. messages that we received growing mm-hmm. up. And so if we you know, kind of peel back those layers... Yeah we get to reclaim our bodies like that. Mm -hmm. Other people don't get to set those rules for us. And pleasuring, whether it's our clitoris or a massage on another body part, Mm -hmm. why should that be different? Yeah. I'm I'm wondering just like the... I wish I had just gone straight to like a, you know, sexual health specific program now, if I were to go back in time and change my program. Um, But I'm curious, like being being in sex therapy, like if that impacted at all earlier on your relationship, like with your own sex. And like, I would imagine that perhaps maybe some of that shame wouldn't be there as much and that you'd feel the sense of like empowerment to intentionally explore some of these things or to have these different experiences with partners because you're learning all this knowledge about it and and working in it. Yeah. I mean, I think if I can go back and, you know, experience things differently in my own personal life. Um, There's so much stuff that I know now that I wish I could have applied then. Okay, yeah. And, of course, it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's part of why I'm so passionate about sharing, Mm -hmm. you know, this information now because if in my early 20s I knew some of what I know now, Mm -hmm. I want other women to know that. And one of the biggest messages is, you don't have to do specific things for other people Mm -hmm. sexually that doesn't feel good or right to you. And um, I think the other thing is, you know, having sex to try to secure or procure a relationship 
is not the most effective strategy. Yeah. That's from my own lived experience. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. from the work that I do yeah. that, you know, trying to turn a hookup into a relationship is really hard. Yeah. And I don't know many people who've done it just from my own, you know, Mm -hmm. circle and patience. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and it's even just hearing you say that, that like you don't have to do anything for someone else's pleasure that you don't want to do. But even I think maybe just as a woman, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but like in ways that doesn't feel true Mm. in ways it feels like, well, no, like I should do that. Like that is Mm -hmm. what I'm like supposed to do Mm -hmm. in some ways. And Mm -hmm. I think even if I... If I think back to high school after my first boyfriend who I lost my virginity with, I 100% was like, oh, the way to love is through like hooking up with people. Like if I hook up with him and if I'm like intimate with him, then he's going to really like me. He's going to want to be with me. Yeah. And it's so like, unfortunately, there is such this positive reinforcement that happens. Well, sure. Like like at that young of an age, Well, what we're really seeking is intimacy and connection. Mm -hmm. And there's this message and narrative that men just want sex. So if you give them that, then maybe it's an exchange for some intimacy. There was a book I read a few years ago. There's a book called like Having Sex, Wanting Intimacy. Hmm. And I hear this a lot from the women that I work with where Mm -hmm. they're like, you know what? The sex, hookup sex is not often really good quality sex for a lot of, um, you know, cis women. Mm -hmm. They're not having orgasms. And often they're, you know, doing things to just pleasure the partner. And again, Mm -hmm. the goal is like, well, then I get to cuddle or I get some, you know, me time with them. Hope that he'll text me later. (laughs) And then maybe that can turn into something. And let me save you the middle part of that story and cut to the end. It usually doesn't go in that direction. And so I think acknowledging the need and want for more intimacy Mm -hmm. and naming that and knowing that that's totally human and fine and wonderful and you get to set the limits for Mm -hmm. what that can be. Yeah. And... I think all of that is also why we do need to continue and have more, increase the number of conversations that we have around sex, increase our knowledge around sex, because I think just having those conversations and having that knowledge can help with literally all of those things. I'd love to see a world where people have like cuddle hookups. There's literally like... Cuddle parties. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Cuddle professionals. Yeah. But I would love a world where it's like, you know what are you kind of looking for? Well, I just yeah. want someone to come like cuddle with me and yeah. watch a movie. Sometimes oh, great. that's all Let's you want. That, right? <laughs> and you know what? Despite the narrative, there are a lot of cis men who mm-hmm. also want that too. Yeah, for sure. There's so, some big cuddle bugs out there. Yeah. 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 Mm. We need to really strip and shed some of the messages of what we think we're supposed to be doing and really just turn to our own integrity and authenticity and do what we feel is yeah. right for us. Totally. That was so beautifully said. Thank you. So beautifully (laughs) said. And literally everything you said on here and that you say on your Instagram is just all so beautifully said. So thank you so much for having this conversation with me. And there's so many more topics we could go into and things we could We'll have to do like part two sometime. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Um, So if people want to find you, if they want to see more of your work or get in contact with you, how could they find you or reach you? Yeah. So I am most active on Instagram and my handle is at Lauren, oh, Dr. Lauren mm-hmm. Fogel Mercy. Yeah. And um, I think it'll be in the show notes too. Yeah. Yep. So you can find me online mm-hmm. and um, follow my work. Yeah. Yeah. I really honestly appreciate everything that you do put out there. I really love and like appreciate this new wave that I feel like social media is having where therapists are like sharing their knowledge and it's really accessible for people because it's important information that, yeah, we should be learning in school because these are life like relational skills. Yeah. So it's so, so, so so important. important. And, you know, social media cannot be therapy, Yeah, but it's so helpful and healing to have the knowledge and you know just getting other people's stories out there like I said for even just my own life reducing stigma and shame and feeling connected yeah yeah 
Oh, well, thank you so much. And thank you guys so much for making it all the way through this episode. Definitely check out the show notes. I will link some of the uh, resources that we talked about in today's episode, as well as uh, the Instagram page for you guys to check out. Um, thank you again so much. If you have time after listening to this, I would love it if you could head on over to iTunes and leave a star rating review. Or if you're an overachiever and want to leave a sentence or two and let me know what you're liking about the show that would also be super super appreciated so thank you guys so much i hope you have a wonderful rest of your week and i'll talk to you next time this podcast is brought to you by wave podcast network check out all of our shows including the brain candy podcast i don't get it coffee convos and let's talk about it